the show starts in three, two, one, go. Good morning, Kane Sport. It's October the 10th, 2023. I'm Gary Furman, the publisher of Canesport.com. Joined this morning by our manager editor, Matt Shodell, as we discuss the news of the day. Presented today by BirdDogs.com, your phenomenal apparel company that creates the most comfortable polos and shorts uh, for your uh, pleasure. Uh, BirdDogs.com, they even have this, I'll, I'll give you a little sneak peek. I'm going to talk about them later in the show. But this shirt right here that I'm going to hold up. This polo is called Gary's Anatomy, okay? And any company that names a polo shirt after yours truly uh, is worth shopping at in my book. But uh, we'll talk a little bit more about bird dogs later in the show and why Matt Shodell, when I sent him a package of bird dogs merchandise, gave them to his kids. There's an interesting backstory behind that if you haven't heard it. Um, but an even more interesting thing to, uh, to talk about right now, Matt, uh, in terms of the news of the day is the amazing, I'm going to call it amazing. It was amazing. It was interesting. Uh, it was not what I think we expected, but uh, the show of solidarity that was uh, prevalent in uh, Monday's media press conferences with Mario Cristobal and his two coordinators, Shannon Dawson and Lance Guidry, uh, his two coordinators essentially stood up and absorbed as much of the blame for what happened Saturday at Hard Rock Stadium as they could in a clear effort to try to deflect some of what has been taking place out there locally and nationally in terms of criticism of Mario Cristobal. And, uh, man, I was really impressed by that. You know, it, it, it showed me that this is a coaching staff that is together. I thought it was a display of the quality of human beings that are in the building right now, which is something that we see every day and we hear about every day, but the public doesn't always get to see that. Uh, and, you know, for Shannon Dawson to step up and say, I made the call on Saturday night. Uh, and then for Lance Guidry to step up and say, I should have pressured the quarterback on the touchdown play and I need to do better. Uh, I thought it was 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 really interesting and and like I said, a nice sign of uh, the solidarity in the program and these guys stepping up uh, to try to show support for their boss. Yeah, certainly. And uh, I would like to say I take responsibility. It, it actually was my fault. Um, I should not have called the run play for Don Cheney. I was trying to get him over 100 yards. It was wrong. It was wrong. I accept responsibility. It was not on the players. The players did nothing wrong. Don Chaney protected the ball as well as any human being can protect it. Cam Kitchens played perfect defense. It was on me. It was my fault. And I will accept all the repercussions. I mean, it was just ridiculous. Like, as ridiculous I mean, as what I just sounded blame, like. We should blame you for everything. As, as ridiculous as I just sounded, that's what they sounded like at the press conference. Because with, with the athletic director, Dan Radakovich, literally staring at them, which he never comes to the press he didn't conference. stay for the coordinators. He was only there for Mario. I was staring at Mario. Okay. With with Dan Radakovic there for Mario, Mario took responsibility. And then with the coordinators there, you know, both coordinators stood up and, and said, it's on me. It's on me. It's on me. It's on me. You know, Gary was there in person. I was there in spirit. Yeah. Um, they're, that's what I they, do. They took it together, man. They made it. But, a, they made, they said it, all three of us are to blame, essentially. Right. But what... Um, what I will say about just this whole fiasco, uh, you know, it's fine to stand up and say, I, I took, I take responsibility. I take responsibility. It was on me. The players didn't do anything wrong. That's fine. I, I, I have no problem with that. What I don't love is if you're having a press conference and you want to say that, great. Like I'm with you. I think it's fantastic. Take responsibility. Coaches have not been doing that for too long here. So fantastic. What I don't like is they won't say what happened. Like Joe Rose in the morning was the first one who said to Mario Cristobal, what's the process? What happened? And Mario wouldn't answer. Uh, a reporter asked Shannon Dawson the same question. Just what's the process? You know, what happened? So, you know, as media, as fans, let the fans understand this is where the breakdown was. This is why it will never happen again. He wouldn't answer. 
which makes you think there is no process. There was no process because otherwise, what's the harm in saying? Like, the process is Mario and Shannon Dawson talking right, to the you. Process, right. The process is Mario talks to Shannon. Shannon talks to Mario. And they had a bad decision that they made. That's the process. Like, just say it. Don't make pretend that there's some crazy process involving offensive analysts and analytics and a computer spits out me the ball based on the yardage and the time. There's no process. Just say there's no process. This is what happens. I talked to no, Shannon. He talked to me. We made a mistake. I, I, that's Shannon, what I, I don't understand that disconnect there. Well, Shannon Dawson specifically would not talk about what the process was. Neither would Mario. We didn't want, no, they don't want to go there because they're not looking to point fingers. I mean, what uh, fingers are they to point? It's on them. It, they're I the mean, ones who are the process. No, I understand. But, but Mario is taking so much abuse nationally on this subject that I think that they were just looking to. Right. They show, their, a united, show a united line, front, and right. we're not, and we're not, we're not pointing fingers internally here. Right, we're the party on. line is, we'll just say it's our fault, and move on. That was it, and like that's not what media wants to hear. That's not what fans want to hear. They want an explanation, which is natural. This is a team that fans have been following forever, and Mario is a highly paid savior. This happens, and then the savior, it, it's like it's like Jesus coming down and curing leprosy, except for. Half the world. Half the world, you're still going to have leprosy, and we're not going to tell you why. Because, you know, it's we can't explain the process. This half, no more leprosy for you. The other half, let's just see what happens when your arms fall off and limbs start dangling and not working. Let's just see. It'll, it'll be interesting. It's a, you know, we're not going to tell you the process. Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but anyway, the other thing is, I was going to, I was going to mention is, you know, this whole theory, because people have, this is the other problem. When you don't explain things, there's theories. And, and there was a reporter who, who put out there that, his understanding is that they were trying to get Don Chaney above 100 yards rushing or 100 yards rushing, to which yeah, I actually texted the reporter. I texted the reporter the next day and I said, listen, I, I just looked at the stat book and Don Chaney had 100 yards. Yards. And Don Chaney had 100 yards before the final two runs. After the first of the final two runs, he had 102 yards. And then after the last one where he fumbled and gained four yards, he had 106 yards. I said, I said, you know, what, you know, I like, what, what have you heard? And he says, I, I think Miami coaches didn't know that, he says. He, I don't think – so Miami coaches didn't know what Don Chaney's yardage was. They didn't know mathematics to – they could kneel the ball, apparently. Depending who you ask, there's different theories no. for what went wrong. And this is what happens when they won't explain what actually happened because there's just going to be multiple theories out there until – I would have explained what actually happened. And you I, agree. I, I, I agree with you. I would have explained what actually happened. I would have said we need to change the way we approach this. It will be changed. You will never see this again. I apologize to the to, to the players, to the fans. Um, we will be working our butts off for the next seven games to make sure that we can tr do the, everything we can do to right what went wrong on Saturday night. And 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 if if they had taken that approach, which is what I would have recommended, uh, I believe that all the noise would have quieted down. I think people would have accepted that. Um, but, you know, I mean, listen, the, the United front, there was nothing wrong with it. I mean, I thought it was, it was, it was what I liked about it was it, it showed the public what at least I feel like we know to be real in that this is a pretty together group of people that are in this Miami program this year. Uh, the coaching staff is pretty together. Um, uh, in in terms of their day to doing their day to day jobs, and also that they have good human beings in, in this in this staff that are willing to stick their necks out. And remember, these are coordinators that are looking to possibly be head coaches one day, uh, and and keep taking steps forward in their career. Um, there's no like great uh, benefit for standing up in front of the TV cameras and the public and saying, I made that call that everybody across America is ridiculing. I mean, I was kind of stunned to see Shannon Dawson do that quite frankly. Uh, but I understood the method behind the madness. Okay. Can you imagine, imagine he stands up there and says, I told Mario to, to, to take a knee and he said, no, we're running it. Imagine if he stood well, up and said that. Well, he's not going to say that either. But, right. he, but, imagine, but he didn't have to say, I made the call. I, I didn't mean, say he was going to say that. I said, imagine yeah. if he said that. He had no, no choice. The only choice he had was to say, I called it. It was my fault. I mean, so regardless, whatever actually happened. Or use the word we. Or use the word we. He could have used the word we, Matt. He could have. He could have said, you know, we made a mistake. He did say we at one point, actually. He changed. At first he said I, and then there was the second response where he said we. 
but whatever it's semantics I, i'm i'm somewhat over it you know the other problem they're having is you know mario has not built you, you and i i mean i consider mario a friend because i've known him for so long i assume you do too but there and and we both are fair like when mario screws up we say he screwed up like there's players who i know their parents and i'm friends with their parents like i'm still gonna say if their kid plays terribly i'm not gonna sit here and be like oh he's great just because i happen to be friends with the parents but that notwithstanding, Mario has really ostracized a very large amount of the media. Actually, I can't think of any other media who would call him friend besides the two of us at this point. And <laughs> I'm not even kidding. And like, and and we'll get us, and we'll get us assaulted for for no, saying. No, but I think that. we're fair. Yeah. I think we're fair. Well, at least I'm we're fair. Very fair. I'm fair. We're always fair. You'll say we are fair. I'll say I'm fair. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. No, they have but, a bad media situation but, right now. There's no doubt about it. But the reason I'm saying that is because he hasn't built up a lot of goodwill, even with national reporters. So when there's an opportunity like this for the for the Barracudas to attack, uh, with attack. Like Barracudas, just so you know, Barracudas actually don't attack. You could swim by a Barracuda and have no problem, even though the perception is they'll all bunch you to death. It's not true. And you can eat small Barracuda. Can't eat big Barracuda. If you really want to know why, Gary can talk about it later with me. <laughs> uh, do you know why, Gary? No. Do you care? No, right, not I'll really. You, you, you can eat, the big, eat all the big right barracuda now. you want, Gary. You'll be fine. Um, <laughs> uh, small ones are delicious. But anyway, getting back to my point, it's like a feeding frenzy, right? Because the media loves clicks. The media loves headlines. And they're not trying to protect Mario Cristobal whatsoever. If anything, they're no, trying to drag no, him no. down. Like you see Barry Jackson's tweets. Um, you see even, you know, the Sun Sentinel guy, all the uh, major Adam, columnists for all three local newspapers, rip all, them. they rip all, them yeah. And uh, every, all the not, national people, not that it wasn't deserved, but there's a way you do it professionally. And what, honestly, what some of them did cross the line, you know, Barry posting I, yeah. that he threatened his subordinates about talking to the media, you know, stuff like that. That's a little over the line. That's to me, I would never tweet out something that I would not also print. Right. If my publisher is going to say, um, you know, that's something that's hearsay. My publisher is my wife, but you can pretend publisher. it's you. The person who tells the person who gives me orders is my publisher. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> if, if it's not something that your publisher is going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, we can run that in the paper. No problem. If it's not something like that, where they'll be like, you can't write that. And your work for that publication. And it's a major publication. Like you think the Miami Herald would put Barry Jackson's little tidbit. Tid, his tidbit section or whatever, which is actually a really good column. Do you think they would put that in his tidbit section if he sent that in as part of it? That Mario threatened people and said they can't talk to the media? Like, they wouldn't let that go in there. That's hearsay. That's libel. You know, that has to be on the record if you're going to print it. But Barry tweeted it because a tweet, you know, ah, tweet's not real. Tweet can be just made up, whatever. You don't need sources for tweets. And, like, not to, to just, you know, pick on Barry because I actually like Barry. Uh, unlike some other people in the media, um, you know, it, it's just an example of there's been other media members, national media members who are, you know, doing similar type stuff. And, you know, I don't know if it's fair to Mario. I don't think I don't think they would do it to other head coaches at other programs uh, because there would be repercussions. Uh, they would lose sources. They would lose information. But Mario gives out no information. Mario gives out nothing, uh, tries to shut down every source. And so, you know, media tries to punish him for it uh, to some extent. It's like when Dennis Erickson tried to ban the Miami Herald from the press box. And like Dennis just got slammed by every publication for every little thing he ever did from then on. And they also forced him to allow the Herald back in the press box. Like you can't win against the media. And the sooner Mario realizes that, like maybe it works in Eugene. Uh, you know, maybe it works in places where like the city is just some dude's first name, but it does not work. In Miami, and Mario should know better than to try it here. Like, you're not going to win against the media. You're better off making the media your friend, giving them little tidbits that you want out there in the world versus nobody gets anything and too bad and you suck and don't bother coming to practice and, and all this other stuff, which, you know, we still hear plenty of stuff. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't, probably doesn't bother you, uh, but it does not ingratiate himself to anybody. And in fact, it probably is hurting the program uh, in terms of getting good publicity, good stories out there which help recruiting, which help everything else, which help the fan base, which help put fans in the seats, which again helps recruiting because you need fans in the seats. And it's just, it's almost like a vicious cycle where Mario's just shooting himself in the foot for no reason, just to spite the media. And, you know, and I think these kinds of examples are going to keep cropping up where something goes wrong for Miami and it blows up as embarrassing national news when like, you know, for another program, this is maybe a one or two day news cycle and it's done. And then, you know, they win the next game, whatever. Oh, this is not going to be a one or two-day news. Be, 
will never be over. Every little thing. They're on national TV again Saturday night. You don't think they're going to be talking about it? Correct. And and not just that. They'll be talking next year's game. The year after that. They're going to be playing this forever. Like, that doesn't happen at Ohio State, at Georgia, whatever. Because, you know, those programs have a different level of respect from the media than what Miami does. And to get respect, yes, of course, you have to win a little bit. But you also have to treat the media with respect to get respect back. Like, that's a thing. And Mario knows that. If you want respect, earn respect. The way you earn respect is to give respect. Um, and like, you know, that's not what's happening right now with this, with this program, uh, whether fans like it or not, I know fans hate the media, uh, but like, that's just, I'm just telling you like it is like, that's just what's happening. You feel better? No. You, you feel better getting all that off your chest? No, it's just, that, that's the truth. I don't care. It's just what it is. It is what it is. I'm not making it up. All right. So anyway, if you guys haven't looked at uh, the the stories from from yesterday with the with the coordinators of Mario, I encourage you to do so. They're 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 pretty interesting. And um, like I said, I think that what they were looking to show is we are together. We are not pointing fingers here at Miami. That was a horrible thing that happened Saturday night. It's on us. We're moving forward together. And uh, look, I mean, you know, I know a lot of people are really angry out there about it, and. You know, obviously, I totally understand, um, but I think you also can feel good that about the way they're moving into the future. Uh, let's put it that way. You know, I mean, listen, we we can't you can't sit there and kick the dog for you know too many days in a row. You know, it's like you know the for a day or two, yeah, you could punch you know walls and you know kick your dog, etc. But at some point, mentally have to move. <laughs> Well, I'm just using figures of speech. I mean, but That's my point is of speech. My point is, is that people now, I think, at some point here, have to move on. And yes, you know, Mario will be holding a place, you know, a certain place somewhere in their brain for a while. Uh, but hopefully, they they can go put on a good showing Saturday at Chapel Hill. Uh, hopefully, they can beat North Carolina. Uh, come home and beat Clemson. If they can pull that off back to back weeks, uh, I think people will start to feel pretty good again about where Miami football is, which is where it was tracking when it was supposed to be five and zero going into this game. So um, anyway, Matt, let me move on from that subject to another subject. Um, we had a story that also that went up on the website yesterday that you and I have not had a chance to talk about on this show. So I figured I would bring it up here right now. Uh, remains on the website for those of you that have not yet looked at it. Uh, it's a film study. Matt, back in that lab, taking a closer look at what Miami defense coordinator Lance Gidry will be up against uh, in trying to slow down North Carolina's Drake May uh, this weekend in Chapel Hill. Uh, Matt, let me give you the floor. Uh, Drake Drake May, uh, I mean, listen, by now everybody knows who this guy is. He's one of the top quarterbacks in the country. Uh, many are projecting him to be a top 10 NFL pick next year. He's got amazing PFF grades. Uh, he's thrown, he has thrown four interceptions this year though, but he's averaging 325 yards a game. Um, he's also can do damage with his feet. He's rushed for 174 yards and four more scores on the ground. So this guy is a dual run pass threat that you are going to have to defend like crazy. Uh, Lance Gidry gave us a clue of what he's thinking. Uh, he's going to want to create some confusion for Drake May, slow down his process. Uh, Matt, tell us what you found when you went in the lab and studied Drake May. Drake maybe can be stopped, but it's going to be hard because as Lance Gidry said yesterday in this press conference, he literally said that they're going to give up 300 passing yards or more to, to, to Drake May at one point. <laughs> Did you catch that part? He said, we can give up 300 yards passing. It's okay as long as we win. He did say so, that, yeah. So... He's already preparing mentally for what's going to be a really, really difficult challenge. And I, I did uh, look at every single game because uh, that's how little of a life I have uh, aside from football, apparently. I took a bunch of clips from every game and I showed pretty much what they're doing. And they're, they're doing things in myriad of, of different ways, but Drake may is just really, really good at, at identifying, getting the ball out quick. And when he, and when he doesn't find his first second or sometimes the third read, if he gets to it open, he's so dangerous with his legs that he can really scramble away from pressure and things like that. And really my takeaway from it all is I don't think North Carolina's offensive line is very good. 
they do have a, a guy Miami fans will remember, Corey Gaynor at center, who played at Miami, obviously, for a long time. So really for Miami, the key is going to be to get pressure quickly and make Drake May run and, and hope for the best. Because North Carolina, their, their run game is better than it was. We'll analyze that later in the week. But Miami's run defense is number one in the nation right now. There's nobody better stat-wise than Miami at stopping the run, 58.2 yards per game. And I think that's going to continue. So it just comes down to getting quarterback pressure, where Miami's been so-so to this point. Without Akeem Mesador, it's really been a little bit of a challenge. And I think the leading sack guy right now is, believe it or not, Thomas Gore. Like, that's how much of a challenge it's been, right? A defensive tackle who's a backup, really, when everyone's healthy, is the leading sack guy with two. So it's going to be really interesting to see if Lance Gidry can dial up some things to, to make Drake May uncomfortable. I don't know. He said he's going to unleash the entire playbook at Drake May. I don't know that they really have that much more of a playbook that they're going to show, but they've done quite well with what they've been doing. And I, my guess is they're going to start off the game trying to do some of the things they've used before, maybe with a little bit more confusion, lining up seven at the line, six at the line, trying to drop a guy or two, bring five a lot. Sometimes they may rush three. They're going to mix up a lot of different looks and just try to find something that works and then stick with that until it doesn't work and then find something else that works and stick with that until it doesn't work. That's all you can do against Drake May because there's nothing that's going to work the whole game against this guy. You have to constantly be adjusting. He's a top five, top 10 NFL pick. He's got a room full of, of really talented receivers and three tight ends who all can catch. And they use them in exquisite ways. If you look at the film breakdown I did yesterday, you'll see that these three tight ends are dangerous, dangerous weapons, especially in the red zone. So it's it's going to be tough, man. I, I don't I don't think that Miami really can stop North Carolina effectively. And I think that Miami has to outscore North Carolina, which means they have to look a lot better on offense. And North Carolina's defense is a lot improved compared to a year ago. This is a, a mid-range defense now instead of a bottom-tier defense. So, look, I was surprised, honestly, when I did the line come out at, at, at minus three or plus three for Miami, I guess, minus three for North Carolina, something like that. But Yeah, I haven't really looked, to be honest with you. Know, that's, that's a little surprising to me. I think North Carolina is ranked 12th in the country. They're rolling really well. They have a really amazing offense. So we're going to see. We're going to find out a lot uh, about – this game, and I don't know if you're going to talk about my column this morning, but in my column this morning, I'll get there. I'll get there. Oh, I'm right now, right now, it, right? trying to talk about Drake I, May. I guess I can't lead into it. All right, yeah, Drake yeah, May. Very difficult. A minute. <laughs> very difficult to stop this guy. Well, all right. Here's the thing: they they had Phil Longo as their offensive coordinator, okay, yeah. and he was he's one of the he's at I think Wisconsin now, and he's he's one of the more respected offensive coaches in the country, okay. So you know he had. Uh, Drake May, uh, la obviously last year, and they were 18th in the nation. Um, no, no, I'm sorry. They were um, okay. Wait, I'm I got I got it mixed up. They're 18th in the nation this year, but yeah. last year they averaged 34.4 points and 462 yards. Okay, this is with Phil Longo calling the plays. Okay. So they bring in this new offense coordinator. Phil Longo goes to Wisconsin. They bring in this new offensive coordinator, Chip Lindsey, this year. And, like, they haven't skipped a beat. In fact, they're better this year than they were last year. This year, they went from 34.4 points last year to 36.6 points a game thus far this year. So they've gone up about 2.2 points a game. And, in, and they've gone up about almost 40 yards a game, 462 last year to 500 yards a game this year, which is ninth in the nation. So, so they have gotten better since they brought Lindsay, who was the coordinator at UCF uh, for a year, um, and before that was the head coach of Troy. By bringing him to North Carolina, they got better in terms of stats than they were under Phil Longo. So, uh, you know, this is, like Matt said, this is going to be a major, major uh, challenge, no doubt about it. If you have not yet had a chance to look at this film breakdown and analysis, I encourage you to do so. Uh, Matt, I, it pains me to say this, um, but he does do great work uh, when we lock him in the closet and just, you know, gets to spend his day watching film and, and come up with these analysis stories for you guys. So um, make sure that you check that out as well. Um, 
And as he mentioned a moment ago, we also have a column on the website this morning talking about um, where Miami goes from here after that disappointment against Georgia Tech Saturday night. And, uh, you know, Matt, it's easy to say, oh, they're going to great heights. They're doing this. They're doing that. We can say whatever the heck we want. The, the, the fact of the matter is that is going to be a tough, tough experience to, to put in the past and forget about. And just that aspect alone makes getting ready for North Carolina on Saturday on the road in their stadium at night. Uh, you know it's going to be wild there. Uh, it makes it tougher for these kids uh, to just, hey, 24-hour rule, put this thing aside. And things are just going to, you know, be back to normal and better for us. And we're going to go beat North Carolina. Congratulations to them if they can do it and show up there and play a great game and get this done. But uh, as that pertains to your column on um, where things are going from here, just give everybody just a little synopsis of your feelings. Yeah. Well, Shannon Dawson said something interesting yesterday. Also, he said that he was concerned heading to Georgia Tech because in his experience, his teams were never ready, apparently, off bye weeks to play really well. And he wasn't surprised how bad they looked in the first half, which I was shocked to hear. I don't, I don't, I mean, this isn't a, na it's not a national thing, is it? Where every team that comes off a bye week plays terribly. I, I don't understand why it happens at Miami and it happens with this new coordinator here. I, I don't understand it. But as it pertains to this particular game, they're no longer off a bye week, uh, Coach Dawson. So that's good news. No more sluggishness, no more excuses, because uh, they're going to have to come out firing from all cylinders from the start. Like I said, they have to just basically outscore North Carolina. I expect a very high-scoring game. And, yeah, I think Miami can win it. You know, very much like Georgia Tech was angry in the last game, Miami will be angry in this game. And North Carolina now is the undefeated home team that's riding high and expecting to win and is watching how Miami struggled so much and looked terrible against Georgia Tech. And maybe their players will be the ones that say, ah, this isn't organic chemistry. This is Shakespeare. And they'll take a little bit of time off. They don't have beaches in North Carolina, so yeah, you love mentioning Shakespeare. Go, You've been doing this, you're doing so, this on a day on a daily basis. So they'll go pellet gun hunting for squirrels and sheep and whatever they do up there, and uh, Miami can come in and and shock them and get back on track. Because to me, and what I wrote about this is the one of the points in my column this morning, which I urge nobody to read because nobody wants to read about a team that lost a game. Uh, God forbid they lost a game. So. My point is, as weird as it sounds, this was shaping up to be a monumental game, right? If Miami beats Georgia Tech, it's two top 20 teams, two undefeated teams, two teams that whoever wins has a pretty decent chance of being in the ACC title game and therefore a chance to be in the playoffs. As big a game as Miami will have had probably since that Notre Dame game that Miami won in, what was that, 2017? When 2017? Yeah. 2017, yeah. yeah, wow, you were, you were 83 years old in 2017. That's amazing. That was a long time ago. So it was going to be a huge game, a massive game. The biggest game to me, it would have been bigger than Texas A&M because the Texas A&M game, you want to win, but you don't really know what you have. When you, after you beat Texas A&M, now it's like, okay, we got something. Let's keep it going. And now you're undefeated. North Carolina's undefeated. It's massive. So what happens? Miami loses. Now, as I looked at it, and that's what I, what I wrote this morning, it's a, to me, it's an even bigger game from Miami, which when I started writing the column, it, it sort of caught me by surprise when I realized that, to tell you the truth. I didn't start writing the column thinking that's where it was going to wind up. I'm not even kidding. I started writing the column. Just, and then you yeah. had this great revelation. I started writing the column with the thought this being, with the thought being what Miami needs to do to get back on track and, and what it would mean if they get back on track for the program. But as I thought about that a little deeper, I realized what the repercussions are if they lose this game right? What happens perception-wise? What happens in the building? What happens to the fan base heading into the Clemson game at home, which is a massive recruiting game and a massive game period, if they lose at North Carolina? Fans aren't going to show up. Fans are going to be even angrier, right? Losing two in a row. Why didn't they respond off that loss? The program's going nowhere. We're going to start hearing the fire Mario Cristobal. Some moron's going to hire. Can I say moron anymore? I don't know if that's an acceptable term. Some brain deficient person is going to hire a plane to to fly a banner over the stadium, you know that sort of stuff. They won't do that yet. But that's my point. This is where it is heading when you have too many losses that upset the fan base in a row. You can't in today's modern day and age. God forbid you lose two in a row, as ugly as the last one was, and now lose another one after that, and don't show that you know you're a better team after 
Mario had talked up the player led, you know, this is finally a player led team. The, the, the culture is fixed, you know, or, or is about fixed. All we are is a couple of recruiting classes away, uh, that sort of thing. So this game is massive. You lose this game, you have all that negativity, you lose a ton of energy, you lose a fan base for probably quite a bit of the season, unless you can beat Clemson and Florida State and or Florida State at that point. So it's it's very detrimental to recruiting. It's very detrimental to the players. It's very detrimental to the direction Miami wants to go if they lose. Now, if they win, it's the total opposite, right? Because now Georgia Tech was a blip. Look at how fantastic this team responded against the number 12 team on the road. That horrendous loss. This, this, if they win at North Carolina, the whole message nationally will and should be that this is a psychologically strong program now, that nothing can hold Miami back anymore. There's no more, we lost to FIU, up, oh, we just lost the final two games of the year because we went in the tank. Oh, we lost to Virginia in the final game of the Orange Bowl. Oh, well, we lost the next two games in blowouts because we can't respond. This will be viewed now as a program that really is what Mario Cristobal says it is, what Mario Cristobal is selling to recruits, yeah. a resilient program, a program where the players try their hardest no matter what, a business-like approach. How you do anything is how you do everything. Uh, so there couldn't be a bigger dichotomy, you can look that up, but Gary, between the two options on Saturday, win or lose. Lose is a disaster. Win is really huge for the program, huge. whereas if they had won against Georgia Tech and lost at North Carolina, it would be, okay, they lost their first game against a really good team. That's okay. We're still progressing. We're still going to get there. It's a process. And if they had won in North Carolina, everything would be amazing too. So because they lost against Georgia Tech now, it's a whole different dynamic to this game that's so that makes it so much more important that Miami wins because of what I just laid out. And I don't know if fans thought about that. Maybe fans are smarter than I am. Maybe you thought of it. I doubt it. But I just happened to think about that when I was writing this column, and it surprised me how much more important this game is now because of a loss than it would have been if they had won on Saturday night. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, I, I, I think it's everything. You know, I mean, they, they win this game. People are starting to think, okay, Miami would have been 6-0. and You know, they're 5-1, they're and one, uh, but they would have been 6-0. and And they'll start getting the benefit of the doubt in, in polls and things like that amongst all the one-loss teams. Uh, you know, people will remember how they lost. Uh, now, it's a, it would be, at, at, you know, reaching right now for us to suggest that this team's going to make it to December with only one loss. I mean, you've got this North Carolina game on the road. You got Clemson at home. Uh, you still have to go at NC State. You still have to go at FSU. And then you've got to play a, a, a hot Louisville team at home. I mean, you know, you got five extremely difficult games. And, and you know, I mean, right now you, you got to win <laughs> – just to get bowl eligible. I mean, you know, this is not going to be a picnic here these last seven weeks. I mean, this is going to be a very tough deal week after week after week. So um, throwing one away that you needed to win was not what the doctor ordered at all. And I agree with Matt. It does amp up the pressure beginning this Saturday uh, at Chapel Hill. Uh, I don't know if the players will feel that pressure as much as maybe the coaches, but uh, it will amp up the pressure for sure. Uh, for this weekend. Um, all right, so there's a few uh, recruiting things I'm going to talk about also, but first let me take a moment here and talk about Bird Dogs, okay, which is rapidly becoming my favorite clothing brand because uh, this stuff is just so incredibly comfortable. I've got, I actually got Bird Dog shorts on right now. I've got another pair of Bird Dog shorts here that I was going to show you guys, and, um, you know, they're, they're, they're really, you know, Nice, they got you know nice color, um, you know uh, designs. But the big thing about these bird dog shorts is they come with these built-in liners, okay, inside the shorts. So that means that um, you know if, if I, I mean I'm just gonna be blunt. If you don't want to wear underwear, guys, you don't have to wear underwear when you wear your bird dog shorts, and um, they are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and leg that will give you a real sculpted look when you walk around in these bird dog shorts. And um, they do the exact same thing as what Lululemon professes to do. I know Lululemon is that huge national brand everybody's heard of. These bird dog shorts are better than Lululemon. Just All you gotta do is buy, 
buy yourself a pair and and you will see what I'm talking about. They fit way better than regular shorts that are stiff, restricting cotton. Um, these are, are very unique fabric. It's it's a cloud. It's they call it a cloud knit fabric, and it looks just like khaki, but it, it it stretches. It stretches really nice, so you get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement in the shorts. And um, here's something else for you guys um, that are sweaters. And, and like I mentioned, they also make these these really nice polo shirts. This one is if you look on their website in the in the uh, products. This one's called Gary's Anatomy. They have these like really cool hip names for all of all of their products. Um, but they use an anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that will keep you cool and most of all dry all day long. Um, they have hats, uh, you know, so you hats, polos, uh, shorts, a lot of different products. Go to birddogs.com and check them out right now. Um, and they got one other little offer for you guys. You see this? This is a hydro. I gotta get this framed right. This is a hydro flask. Okay, it's a it's a hydro flask style water bottle that is really really well made, very high high quality. Um, if you go to birddogs.com/canesport, okay, and um, you use the promo code canesport when you're there shopping, they will send you with your purchase one of these flasks for free. So check them out, birddogs.com. Use the code name Canesport to get your free flask and buy yourself a couple products. Check them out. I do not think you will be sorry. I am telling you, I've got a bunch of them now and I wear them almost on a daily basis around the house. They're just so comfortable. Um, I think that's what you will find. So go to birddogs.com. Remember that uh, promo code Canesport and um, I think you will be happy that you did all right matt um i know you have not gotten into those liner shorts yet you've you've you know you've been throwing them at your kids they love them because gives them less laundry to do um but um let's talk recruiting here for a moment uh miami uh got a commitment yesterday from nicar we talked about that um we have another story that'll be on the website today the inside story behind nicar's uh, commitment to Miami. So you got that to look forward to uh, today. Uh, we also have a story uh, on 2025 running back DeAndre Desinor from Fort Lauderdale American Heritage. She's a four-star prospect. Um, Miami is doing really well with him. Uh, I mean, he's hanging in there with the Canes. Check out what he's saying in the story that's on the website today. Uh, we also catch up with uh, another uh, American Heritage product, uh, running back Byron Lewis. And uh, for him, he's not all rattled by what happened Saturday at Hard Rock. You could check out what he's saying today as well. In addition to that, we will be talking to several players uh, today. We will bring that to you on the website as the day moves forward. In a program note, King Sport Live returns tomorrow night. 8 o'clock, summit meeting of the Canes, Canes Nation. That promises to be a very animated show uh, with lots of uh, uh, varied, probably, commentary uh, that we're going to hear. Um, a lot of people have a lot of things they want to say about what they saw Saturday night, about what they think moving forward. So I'm expecting a very action-packed Cane Sport Live show tonight at 8. Make sure you join us for that. And then tomorrow night, we will have the Lamar Thomas show at 8 o'clock tomorrow night. So uh, uh, a lot of things for you guys to listen to, a lot of things for you guys to read. We got it going on at canesport.com. So that's going to do it for today for Good Morning Canesport. We thank you so much for starting your day out with us. If you're on YouTube, uh, hit your like button, the subscribe button. It helps us with the algorithms at YouTube. Um, if you are not yet a subscriber to canesport.com, please, please, please hop on over to our website, uh, and, and join our community. You will not be sorry there either. We've got a great group of fans, a couple of them. Uh, we had a talk off the ledge this weekend. Uh, a couple of them were getting a little loose with their rhetoric, no argument, uh, but they are passionate. The, the one thing you could say is whether you agree with what they say or not, they are passionate. Um, we bring you a ton of content 
every single day. I think we average like 10 stories a day. Uh, you got a lot, a, a lot, a lot, a lot to enjoy at canesport.com. And your subscriptions allow us to do what we do every single day, which obviously we greatly appreciate uh, trying to enhance your fan experience. So for Matt Shodell, I'm Gary Furman. Thank you so much for joining us again today, everybody. And we will see you tomorrow. Have a great day.